In this uh, module on uh, combustion thermodynamics, we will uh, discuss uh, how uh, concepts that uh, you learnt in the previous course, uh, concepts such as uh, steady flow energy equation as well as uh, entropy balance of a control volume uh, can be applied to uh, combustion and in particular uh, combustors. Okay. The interesting aspect of um, uh, this application is that we will take into account chemical reactions also. So, normally uh, when we say uh, for instance in the case of a Braden cycle, uh, we assume where we assume that, that there is a uh, reservoir at a high temperature, but we really did not worry about how the heat was being supplied from the reservoir or how the reservoir itself was being maintained at a high temperature. In this case, we will take a closer look at uh, such reservoirs where Usually, uh, the uh, uh, the high temperature is a result of um, uh, burning of fuel, and heat is released as a result of that. Okay, so we are going to take a closer look at uh, combustion of uh, fuels and uh, apply energy balance and also entropy balance to um, uh, to such devices. Okay, so let us uh, start with. Uh, Uh, the first topic which is combustion stoichiometry. Uh, combustion is an oxidation reaction that is accompanied by heat release. So, basically all combustion reactions are exothermal. Okay. So, for instance, if you look at this reaction H2 plus half O2 uh, giving H2O. Uh, this is a combustion reaction in which 1 uh, kilo mole of hydrogen combines with half a kilo mole of O2 to uh, form 1 kilo mole of water vapor. Okay. Now, since we are talking about combustion thermodynamics, uh, we will not worry too much about the, um, uh, the details of how the combustion takes place. For instance, you know uh, whether the fuel uh, and the uh, oxygen or air it has been mixed well, uh, whether uh, it has been ignited properly, whether the combustion can indeed propagate. Those are issues which are left to uh, uh, combustion text. So, combustion text uh, typically would deal with these uh, sort of aspects, whether combustion can be initiated in a particular scenario, whether it can be sustained in a, <clears throat> in a particular uh, scenario and so on. So, in this course, we will not uh, look at those types of details. This is a thermodynamics course, applied thermodynamics course. So, basically what we would say is uh, when we write this, we assume that combustion will take place and heat will be released and products will be formed. Now, the required oxygen may be provided in one of uh, two different ways, the oxygen that is required for combustion. Remember, combustion is an oxidation reaction. So, the oxygen that is required for combustion may be provided either as a pure oxygen stream or as is commonly done, uh, the oxygen could be taken from atmospheric air. Okay. Atmospheric air as you know in the absence of any humidity contains 21% uh, O2 by volume and 79% N2 uh, by volume. Okay. So, every kilo mole of O2 that is supplied is accompanied by 3.76 kilo moles of N2. So, if you are supplying air then for every kilo mole of O2 3.76 kilo moles of N2 accompany, uh, accompanies the oxygen. Okay. So, if we uh, if we accomplish the combustion in the previous reaction by using oxygen from the air instead of a pure oxygen stream, the reaction would look something like this. So, we replace the O2 with O2 plus 3.76 N2 because every kilo mole of O2 is accompanied by 3.76 kilo moles of N2. What is that? Uh, N2 appears now in the product uh, side also. Okay. Again, uh, in this course, because it is a thermodynamics course, we will assume uh, nitrogen to be inert, that nitrogen does not participate in the chemical reaction. However, nitrogen will absorb uh, the heat that is released from the reaction and so it will, its temperature will go up. So, we have a mixture of ideal gases uh, on the product side and nitrogen will, uh, uh, will participate there. In other words, um, uh, the enthalpy changes in nitrogen will be accounted for as we have always done for a mixture of ideal gases. However, chemically nitrogen will be assumed to be inert. Okay? So, it will not combine with oxygen uh, for the kind of situations that we are looking at. In reality, however, you know that as the temperature becomes higher, the nitrogen combines with the oxygen to form oxides of nitrogen which are pollutants as you know 
since they can be harmful to the environment okay but in this course we will not uh, you know we will not deal with such complications now let us consider uh, the combustion of uh, liquid n octane okay which is something like uh, petrol or gasoline not exactly but uh, uh, close enough okay so liquid n octane would be uh, c8h18 and the uh, subscript l denotes that it is in the liquid form okay um, is burnt in air so we have o2 plus 3.76 n2 and it's completely burnt in air okay so there is complete combustion of uh, of the uh, n octane complete combustion here means that um, the uh, combustion products are fully oxidized meaning that all carbon in the fuel is converted to co2 and all hydrogen in the fuel is converted to h2o and there is no excess oxygen in the product stream okay these are very important so all combustion products are fully oxidized and there is no excess oxygen in the product stream so the balanced uh, combustion equation for this may be written like this okay so each kilo mole of fuel here requires 12.5 kilo moles of o2 or 59.5 that is 12.5 times 4.76 59.5 kilo moles of air for complete combustion so this much amount of air is usually called theoretical or stoichiometric air by stoichiometric what we mean is that complete combustion all uh, species are oxidized in the fuel or oxidized and no excess oxygen in the product stream so this is called theoretical or stoichiometric air So, the stoichiometric air fuel ratio on a molar basis is 59.5 kilo moles of air per kilo mole of fuel. On a mass basis, we may write it like this 59.5 kilo mole of air per kilo mole of fuel and molecular weight of air is 28.97. So, 28.97 kg per k mole of air and molecular weight of uh, n octane is 114 so 114 kg per k mole of fuel so this allows us to convert this into a uh, into a quantity on a mass basis so air fuel ratio on a mass basis is 15 kilograms of air per kg of fuel now it is uh, somewhat striking uh, that the air fuel ratio on a mass basis for almost all hydrocarbon fuels is very close to this value of 15 uh, even for uh, fuels which are as light as methane to fuels which are as heavy as uh, kerosene which would be dodecane. So, so from light fuels like methane to heavy fuels like, uh, uh, like diesel, the uh, stoichiometric air fuel ratio on a mass basis is around 15. Okay. Um, I have not go through the derivation, uh, interested students uh, may uh, look up this derivation which is given in my uh, textbook. Okay. It is very close to 15. So, that number is worth remembering that air fuel ratio theoretical or stoichiometric air fuel ratio on a mass basis for hydrocarbon fuels is around 50. In many uh, practical applications, the amount of air used is always in excess of the stoichiometric amount of air. You cannot just use the exact stoichiometric amount of air in practical situations. There are several reasons for this. Okay. One important reason is that when we use excess air, we have additional amounts of O2 and additional amounts of N2 on the product side. Okay. So, when we use uh, air which is uh, more than uh, what, is, uh, what is required, as you can see here. So, this is the balanced chemical reaction for um, stoichiometric amount of air. So, when we supply excess air, that means excess O2 and excess N2, we are going to have some amount of uh, O2 in the product stream and some amount of N2 in the product stream. So, the presence of these additional amounts of oxygen and nitrogen serve to dilute the combustion products and also result in reduction in the peak temperature. Okay. So, the peak temperature can now be reduced and it can be reduced to manageable levels. Okay. For instance, in the case of uh, uh, Brayton cycle or aircraft engine which uh, uses the uh, open uh, form of the Brayton cycle, uh, the air fuel ratio is actually around um, uh, 60 to 1 or so. Uh, 
which as you can see is four times the uh, theoretical value. Okay, but that much amount of air is required to actually dilute the combustion products and uh, keep the uh, operating temperature at a reasonable level. Remember, in the combustion in a Brayton cycle, experiences the peak temperature continuously, unlike an auto cycle or a diesel cycle. We mentioned this aspect earlier. Okay, so the peak temperature in the case of an auto cycle or diesel cycle appeared to be more than that of uh, Brayton cycle, but in the case of the auto cycle and diesel cycle, or uh, their real life counterparts uh, or the uh, counterparts which use these cycles in real life namely so the uh, SI engine and the CI engine. Uh, these peak temperatures are experienced only momentarily at the beginning of combustion and then uh, the temperature comes down very rapidly. Whereas, in the case of the gas turbine combustor, these temperatures are experienced continuously because that is operating at uh, steady state. So, it uh, is much more challenging. So, which is why uh, much higher air fuel ratios are used in the case of uh, uh, gas turbine engines to keep the temperatures at manageable levels. Now, in the case of uh, SI and CI engines, the, um, uh, the air fuel ratios are closer to the stoichiometric value of 15. Okay, In order to ensure that combustion uh, takes place and is uh, steady. So, uh, different um, different environments, working environments and different engines require different types of uh, different amounts of air or air fuel ratio. Okay? Now, the other uh, advantage of uh, supplying excess air is that the presence of excess oxygen tends to stabilize the combustion. Uh, sometimes what may happen is that when you supply the exact amount of oxygen in a practical combustor, the oxygen may not spread uniformly to all parts of the combustor. So, that in some parts of the combustor there may not be sufficient oxygen and the fuel may be starved for oxygen whereas, in other parts there may be excess oxygen. Okay? So, this means that you know the combustion is going to be sort of non-uniform across the combustor and the performance will also not be uh, very stable. In order to prevent this kind of a situation, if you supply excess air to begin with, then you are at least making sure that there is a reasonable chance that the fuel uh, will always be burning under uh, stoichiometric or with excess oxygen. Okay? So, the combustion is going to be much more stable for that reason. Okay? The downside or the flip side of supplying uh, excess air is that because of the presence availability or free availability of oxygen uh, in the um, in the reactant side, um, uh, you know, uh, much more uh, oxides of nitrogen are likely to be formed because there is uh, uh, plenty of oxygen in the product side. The more of the nitrogen will combine with oxygen to form nitrous oxides, which is not very desirable. So, practical combustor designs as you can see are very challenging because of this conflicting considerations. So, the idea of excess air uh, naturally leads to the definition of the equivalence ratio denoted by the uh, letter uh, uppercase phi, Greek letter uppercase phi. So, phi is defined as actual air fuel ratio divided by, I am sorry, actual fuel air ratio divided by stoichiometric fuel air ratio. So, fuel air ratio is the reciprocal of the air fuel ratio that we have been uh, discussing so far. Okay? So, if uh, phi is equal to 1, then of course, you know, we have supplied the exact amount of air or theoretical or stoichiometric amount of air. If phi is less than 1, that means the fuel that we have supplied is actually less than what is required uh, for theoretical uh, combustion for the given amount of air. So, it is said to be fuel lean. And if phi is greater than 1, then we have supplied more fuel than what is required for stoichiometric combustion and so it is said to be fuel rich. So, if you look at the, um, uh, the two engines that I mentioned so far, uh, gas turbine engines typically tend to operate at um, uh, equivalence ratios near 0 0.4 or so. Uh, 
which is very close to being on what is called the lean limit of combustion. As I said, you know, we do not worry about such um, uh, intricate aspects in this course because it is a course on thermodynamics. But if you uh, do a course on combustion, there they uh, you know you would learn that um, uh, phi equal to 0 0.4 is very close to the lean limit of combustion for most hydrocarbon fuels. What we what do we mean by lean limit? Which means that if you make the uh, the products, I'm sorry, the reactant seem uh, or if increase the amount of air any uh, any more, the fuel will not will simply not burn at all. The fuel will burn only within a certain uh, flammability limits. So below the value on the lean side, the fuel will not burn. Above the value on the rich side also, above a certain value on the rich side also, the fuel will not burn. There is too much fuel and uh, too little oxygen on the rich side. On the lean side, there is too much oxygen and too little fuel. On the rich side, too much fuel and uh, too little oxygen. So, these are the flammability limits. So, uh, when you do a course on combustion, you will be taught all these uh, sorts of aspects. It is not simply enough if you just write down the uh, combustion equation and then say that uh, combustion will take place, not necessarily. The temperature has to be favorable, uh, mixing has to be uh, favorable and flammability limit has to be favorable. All uh, these conditions have to be satisfied. There must be sufficient time for the uh, fuel to uh, react and burn. And so, there are many uh, constraints, practical constraints that come when you actually design a combustor. Okay, let us uh, work out a couple of um, uh, worked examples. First one reads like this, a dry analysis of the uh, products from the combustion of methane with air is as follows, CO2 9 percent, CO 2 percent, O2 2.11 percent and N2 86.89 percent by volume. Calculate the excess air equivalence ratio and the dew point temperature of the products assuming the pressure to be 100 kilo Pascal. <coughs> So, the product analysis is given on a volumetric basis and since we are um, using the Dalton's model, it is the same as a molar basis. Okay? Now, combustion of a hydrocarbon uh, fuel such as methane would have produced water vapor, but this analysis is dry on is done on a dry basis. So, that aspect also needs to be taken into account. <coughs> So, if you assume 100 mole of uh, 100 k mole of dry products, then we may write the uh, uh, the actual combustion reaction like this: A moles of CH4 combined with B moles of uh, air to uh, form this product stream. Okay. <coughs> Remember, uh, H2O is also present in this product stream. But this, let me just use a slightly uh, different. So, this plus this plus this plus this add up to uh, 100 and so if we balance the equation, we are able to get A and B. So, the uh, complete combustion reaction uh, reads like this. So, 11 kilo moles of fuel combines with 23.11 kilo moles of uh, air uh, to give rise to uh, this product stream. So, the actual uh, air fuel ratio, uh, I am sorry, not 23.11, but 23.11 times 4.76, I am sorry. Hence, the actual air fuel ratio is 23.11 times 4.76 divided by 11, which works out to 10.06 kilo moles of air per kilo mole of fuel. Now, for complete combustion, all the carbon in the fuel would have been oxidized, all the hydrogen in the fuel would also have been oxidized. So, the complete uh, or stoichiometric uh, combustion of methane with, uh, with air reads like this. So, the stoichiometric air fuel ratio is thus 2 times 4.76 uh, which is equal to 9.52 kilo mole of air per kilo mole of fuel. So, the excess amount of air that has been supplied is 10.06 minus 9.52 and on a percentage basis it works out to 5.67 percent. And the equivalence ratio is 9.52 divided by 10.06. So, 9.946 uh, which is less than 1. That means, the uh, mixture is lean which is which makes sense because excess air has been supplied.
Now, you may recall from the module on psychrometry that <coughs> that the um, uh, uh, that the mole fraction of uh, species let us say H 2 O uh, is nothing but uh, partial pressure of the water vapor which is denoted P V divided by mixture pressure. You may recall that this was what we had uh, written earlier. So, we may actually calculate the partial pressure of water vapor. So, this has been given to be equal to 100 kilo Pascal in this problem. Now, the mole fraction of uh, water vapor in the products may be evaluated simply by uh, looking at this equation. So, if you look at the product stream, uh, we have 9 plus 22 plus 86.89 plus 2 plus 2.11 as the total number of uh, moles in the product stream. So, the number of moles of H2O divided by the total number of moles gives us the mole fraction of H2O in the uh, product stream. So, 22 divided by the uh, total number of moles which is this and from this we may then evaluate the partial pressure of water vapor which works out to 18.03 kilo Pascal. From the steam table, uh, the saturation temperature corresponding to 18.03 kilo Pascal is 57.8 degree Celsius. Okay. Now, why are we calculating a dew point temperature um, in this problem on combustion of a hydrocarbon fuel? Now, the dew point temperature of the products is important uh, because this determines whether the water vapor in the product stream. So, whenever you burn hydrocarbon fuel, there will always be water, uh, water vapor in the product stream. So, the dew point temperature uh, determines whether this water vapor will condense after it leaves the engine or whether it is going to condense in the exhaust tailpipe or even in the muffler or ahead of that. Okay. So, this is uh, very, very important in the design of such equipment. So, if it condenses in the tailpipe or in any of the other components, this can cause corrosion damage, okay. which is why dew point temperature is of uh, particular interest in combustion applications, especially when you are burning a hydrocarbon fuel. Uh, and when water uh, water vapor is likely to be present in the product stream. So, you want to keep the, ex the temperature of the exhaust gases well above this uh, dew point temperature, so that there is no uh, condensation of the uh, of the water vapor in the uh, components or before it leaves the uh, exhaust. The next example uh, reads like this, Indian rice husk a biomass fuel has the following percentage composition on a mass basis C 35, H 5.5, N 1.53, O 36 and uh, sulphur 0.08. It is burnt with 185 percent theoretical air with air at 298 Kelvin 100 kilo Pascal and 75 percent relative humidity. Remember, whenever, whenever we say that you know fuel is burnt with atmospheric air, we cannot always assume the air to be completely dry as we know from our, the module on uh, psychrometry, the air always there is always relative humidity, there is always water vapor in the air. So, this example illustrates how to do uh, combustion calculations when there is water vapor in the incoming air. Okay. So, this is burnt with 185 percent theoretical air with air at 298 Kelvin 100 kilo Pascal and 75 percent relative humidity. Determine the required mass flow rate of air per kg of fuel and the change in the dew point temperature of the products as a result of the humidity in the supplied air. Assume the sulphur in the fuel to be inert. So, this is the information that is given in the in the problem statement, uh, the composition of the fuel on a mass basis, percentage mass basis. So, if we convert this to mole, so we get the, um, uh, the uh, component distribution on a molar basis in the fuel like this. So, now we are in a position to write the balanced chemical reaction. So, the balanced chemical reaction for complete combustion of fuel this fuel with dry air may be written like this with dry air. Now, with 185 percent theoretical air, notice that this 
for 185 percent theoretical error this has to be multiplied by 1.85 okay so times 1.85 times 3 point uh, so 3.1667 times 1.85 so if you balance the uh, uh, chemical reaction this is what you get notice that the nitrogen is uh, inert the sulfur is also inert So, the um, uh, partial pressure of uh, water vapor in the, um, in the product stream. So, now we have the product stream, we can uh, calculate the mole fraction of water vapor from this. So, this is uh, number of moles of water vapor. So, we may evaluate the, um, uh, the mole fraction of water vapor to be 2.75 divided by 30.44275. So, this multiplied by the uh, mixture pressure which is 100 kilo Pascal gives us the partial pressure of water vapor to be uh, 9.033 kilo Pascal and the dew point temperature of the product is nothing but uh, T sat of 9.033 and that comes out to be 44 degrees Celsius. So, this is the dew point of the product stream for combustion with 185 percent theoretical air. 185 percent theoretical air that to dry air per hundred kg of fuel and that is uh, that is what we did uh, here if you remember. So, hundred kg of fuel we converted to a composition like this. So, this is the amount of air that is required. 185 percent excess air that is required for 100 kg of fuel. So, we can convert this into kg of air simply by multiplying by its molecular weight times 28.97 kg per k mole of uh, air per 100 kg of fuel. Now, uh, based on the given data, the partial pressure of um, uh, water vapor in the air, remember uh, the air uh, has 75 percent relative humidity. So, the partial pressure of water vapor in the air is 0.75 times P sat of 298 Kelvin, it uh, works out to 2.37675 and so the mole fraction may be evaluated as uh, the partial pressure divided by the mixture pressure which is 100 kPa. Uh, so, the mole fraction of water vapor is 0 0.023765. So, basically the incoming air has uh, O2, N2 and uh, water vapor. Now, let us assume that um, the ratio of the mole fractions of N2 and O2 to be 3.76, which means that uh, the mole fraction of O2 plus N2 plus H2O should be equal to 1, right. That is uh, that's all there is in the incoming air. And if you use the fact that the ratio of mole fraction of O2 and I am sorry N2 and O2 is uh, 3.76, we can rewrite this expression like this and we may finally get the mole fraction of O2 to be 0 0.2051. So, uh, each k mole of O2 in the humid air is accompanied by 3.76 k moles of N2 and 0.11588 kilo moles of water vapor. So, basically what this uh, says is that the incoming air, the composition in the incoming air in mole fraction is YO2 equal to 0 0.2051, YN2 equal to 3.76 times 0.2051, YH2O equal to 0 0.023765. So, that is the composition of the incoming air. So, every k mole of O2 is accompanied by 3.76 k moles of N2 and by uh, 0.11588 k moles of water vapor. So, the reaction for complete combustion with 185 percent theoretical air may now be written like this. Notice that we have simply added this to the incoming uh, air stream and the amount of water vapor has to be adjusted. like this. 
So, now, uh, now that we have the balanced chemical reaction, we may evaluate uh, the uh, mole fraction of water vapor in the product stream and from that we can work out the uh, partial pressure of water vapor in the product stream. And from that we can evaluate the dew point uh, temperature of the products to be 47.7 degrees Celsius. So, the humidity in the incoming air elevates the dew point by 3.7 degrees Celsius. That is why we uh, worked out the humidity of the uh, product stream with dry air and humidity with humid air because the air that we are taking in is almost always humid. It would have the effect of elevating the uh, dew point temperature of the uh, exhaust stream or product stream which is actually not desirable because then the products or um, the water vapor in the products is uh, much more likely to condense uh, before it leaves the reactor. Okay. So, that is why we actually uh, did this calculation. So, with 75 percent humidity, you can see that for this particular case, the um, uh, dew point temperature is elevated by 3.7 degree Celsius. Uh, so, what uh, we will do in the next lecture is to um, uh, is to prepare ourselves to apply the steady flow energy equation to combustors uh, in which uh, combustion reactions are taking place. So, that would be application of first law to, um, uh, to combustors. Okay. Although we will deal with uh, steady flow reactors extensively, it is not very difficult to apply uh, whatever theory we are um, developing uh, or whatever procedure we are developing in cases where the, um, uh, the combustion reactions take place in a, a non-flow process. For example, uh, com the combustion reactions take place in a steady flow reactor in the case of a gas turbine engine, whereas in the case of an SI engine or CI engine, a uh, combustion reaction takes place in a non-flow process. But the, uh, the theory that we are developing uh, applies without any uh, difficulty or additional uh, difficulties to um, non-flow cases as well.